Hey guys, welcome ladies and gentlemen. Um, today is the fourth installment of the Business of Photography, uh, starring Sam Sherino, who's going to be giving the lecture tonight. It's, uh, today's title is The Importance of Pricing. And I'd like to start by introducing the ambassador, our Nikon ambassador, Sam Sherino. He's a photographer of many titles and accolades, and notably being honored as a triple master of WPPI, which is the Wedding and Port Portrait Photographers International. He's a second-generation internationally renowned photographer for over 25 years and uses creativity, technical knowledge, and keen attention to his clients' individual taste to build a solid reputation of creating work of exceptional artistic creativity. So without further ado, Sam Farino. Thank you, Mo. That sounded really good. <laughs> now I just have to <laughs> present it the same way, right? Good. So how many of you are uh, running a business right now? How many of you are running, uh, let's say, a one-man show, one-person show? What was it? How many people have employees? A few of you. Okay. How many people want employees? Want employees? Want helpers and all that? A few? Yes? Okay. All right. It gets, it gets a little bit more difficult to do the math once you have some people, but there is a formula. And then if you follow that formula, which we'll look at later, a little bit later on, things become easier to understand. So um, you'll, you'll have a, a better time understanding when somebody calls you up and says, how much for this? You should know basically how much you want out of it. Okay. So, how many find it difficult to price things? Be honest. Okay. Um, I find it somewhat difficult sometimes, depending on how they come at me. I know in my mind, when I get the phone call, um, how much I need out of it. So, that's where it starts for me. How much do I need out of this day to contribute to the business, make a profit, make my wage of being there because I'm an employee to the company, okay? Um, so all of these things. So when they come at, come at you on the phone, like I got one today, um, I'd like to know how much you are an hour. Well, my question back would be, well, how many hours are you looking for? Right? Is it two hours? Is it three hours? Is it one hour? Is it about, well, I, always, I would say between five and ten. So they want to pay you five hours. What does that mean? You want files. Okay, so some people f sell files only. But the files would be sold, if you're going to do that, would be sold on a separate, a separate product. Because that becomes a product, regardless of what it is. So the time would be five. But what about tra traveling there, traveling back, preparation, all that? So is that five or is it seven? So again, how much do you want out of a five-hour event or a seven-hour event? And then what are the possibilities of the sales? Meaning what kind of production you're going to do and what you're going to sell. So there's a lot of questions. As they're trying to qualify me, I'm going back trying to qualify them. Because it's very important that we both link up. Somewhere down the line, everything has to be, okay, both the size has, has to be flexible, but at the same time, they want to spend as less as possible, and we want to try to grab as much as possible. But we have to have the right answers for them in order to spend, okay? So that's the whole thing. So at the end of the day, I may say, well, there's a five-hour job, right? And I'll say, okay, how much per hour? You know, you have to have your number to what it is per hour that your operation needs, okay? What does your operation need per hour? Out of five days a week, what do you need to, to take in? So some of you might say, well, I don't work five days a week. I only work one day a week. Okay, so how much money do you want per month? And it still all works the same way. How many, how many jobs do you do? How much per hour in order to get it? So I, I don't like going per hour. I like contribution factors, meaning I want a number per job. Okay, I want a number. So if somebody says, well, it's five hours, to me I could care less if it's five hours or seven hours because I've already calculated eight, right? So how much is it going to be for me to be there for eight hours? 
If it's just files only and it's eight hours, it could be twenty five hundred dollars. You're going to say, "Wow, that's expensive," but I, you know, I, I don't buy the hour. I know that out of the twenty five hundred, let's say, I'm going to get a contribution factor. I'm going to make my salary out of it. The studio gets a profit out of it. Everything is working. Now, if I sell something else after that, bonus. If they say that's good, then we're away to the races. If they say, "Well, we don't have a budget for that. I only have five hundred. Well, I just didn't qualify you at this point, right? Do you really want to do that? Not really. If you're if you're in that position now, once we go through the program, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Because some of you might say, "Well, twenty-five hundred is a lot." Some of you might say, "Well, twenty-five hundred is not enough," and I'm just throwing a number in the air because every situation in here is completely different. Okay, and what makes the difference between every situation? Your overhead, operating expenses, you know, all of these things make a difference. So, have you heard of people saying, well, I have to, you know, how much is an 8x10? I don't know what to charge for the 8x10, so what's the first thing that some novice, maybe photographers, might do? They find out down the street, there's somebody else there, and they're going to find out, well, that, that person charges uh, $7.95 for an 8x10. So does that mean you charge seven dollars and fifty cents? Is this going to be a race to the bottom? Okay. Or does that mean we have to price it according to what is right for your operation, based on your overhead, based on all of these things? So some of us might have a bigger overhead, some of us might have smaller overheads, some of us might have employees, some of us might not, some of us might be doing part time, some of us might be doing full time. So that's what throws everything around and everything's completely different. So then you say, well, how do you get clients? Well then, it's, been, it's in the perceived value part of that, right? The client has to come to you and say, okay, let's say I charge $500 and somebody else charges $300. If the client sees the value in the product, then there's no problem because you already know that this client is looking to spend it, right? So you have to, you have to figure out where you are in the marketplace in order to figure out where are you going to price it? How much volume are you going to need in order to get to the end of the month and be successful? Does that make sense? Okay, so let's go forward. Okay, so this is going to be the business of photography, importance of pricing. So how to price it. And I usually, as I said, I stay away from the hourly thing. And I, I package it up. In my mind, I might say I want $300 an hour. And then I calculate if I find that's not enough, that's why I package it. And then I say, well, it's a maximum of eight hours. Okay. So if I only shoot six, well, you end with part of your. Okay. So pricing perceived value. Okay, because that's basically what we're talking about is how do we how does this uh, product become a perceived value? So price is a communication device. Somebody calls you, you give them a price. It's yes or no or why it is, right? It creates an, an image of the business in the eyes of the customer. Does that make sense? Yes, it's $1,000. Oh, that's not bad. Or yes, it's $1,000. Oh, that's very expensive. So hopefully you get two calls and one is good and one is not, right? So you have to, you're not there for everybody. So you have to find the right client so that you find exactly where you want to be in that marketplace. Price is an indicator of value. Is it? It is an indicator of value. Um, but some of it could be overpriced and some of it might be underpriced because it depends on where you are. So we have to look at the value and look at where you are in the marketplace. Now, you could be a very good artist, excellent artist, trained by the you know very good people, but you don't have let's say, the experience of being out there long enough. So just because you're a very good artist doesn't mean you can price it as if somebody else has been in the business for 25 years. Because you have to build that reputation or the value and the perceived value in order to get there. So you have to be slightly under that. So it's not a matter of just bringing it slightly under that and say, okay, I should be able to score some clients. Where are you going to go from there? And after every client that or every event that you photograph and sell, how much of that is going to be in retained value? How much of that is going through expenses? You've got to know exactly where you are. Okay? So, 
prospects of client, prospective clients buy when they consider the end product to have value, obviously, right? Okay. Benefit divided by price equals perceived value. Okay. This benefits them. Divided by the price is perceived value. It's either yes or no, and away we go. Okay, and I put some images in there just so that it's not just a bunch of business numbers, so it kind of feels like um, you know, you're looking at some images. And, you know, I put this one right at the front because wisdom, right? It's telling us a story of wisdom, all right? Okay, so pricing and marketing incentives. You notice that a lot of people, especially in the retailing business right now, they're using pricing to entice people in their stores, okay? Now, that could be a good thing, that could be a bad thing. If you, if you price everything at an incentive in the store, that means you're liquidating. If you price one or two things, you're getting them in your store, that means you're pricing one thing at maybe cost, but you're hopefully going to sell something else because that's where you want to steer. So basically, if you're going to do something like that, you have to do it so that when they come in, they are going to buy the other product. Okay. So if you decide that you're going to knock off 20% off a 16 by 20 portrait with only if you buy this frame, then you've just sold the frame, you really didn't lose the 20%, maybe you lost 10%, you made the sale in the number, in the scheme of things. That makes sense. If you just say I'm going to knock off 30% on something without a stipulation of buying something else, that's almost like going food shopping and people that buy just whatever's on sale on the flyer. These guys are not going to make any money on that, right? And that would be the same thing with us. We would not make money on it. So you almost have to have an incentive. You buy this, but you only get, you'll get it at 30% if you buy it with this. And then that way, away you go. That makes sense? Okay. So price works in a competitive technique to create a call of action. That's basically what we're trying to do is we're calling action, right? We want you to come in and buy right now. All right. Price could work as a marketing strategy to create volume sales. Okay, so if you haven't been selling too many 8x10s, well, maybe you'll price the 8x10s a little lower, and the 5x7s are going to stay at the same price, so that way you can turn a little bit more 8x10s. Now, one of the reasons you might, you might, have, you might be overstocked on 8x10 frames. So you give an incentive on that, you move your 8x10 frames have been sitting around for a while, and away you go, and things get cleared up. So that's what people are doing. So these are all the things you have to always look at in market. And then you have to think, as photographers, when are you going to do this? Anytime, is it, is it a sense of urgency that's going to call this? Or are you going to plan it? Saying, well, the holidays start from, you know, the holidays in December. Maybe we'll start doing these type of things in the middle of September. Right? So that, because people are opening up their wallets at about that point. And they're not so price conscious because they gotta have it because the gifts gotta go up. That's when things happen. You have to pre-plan it. Uh, what about you know around the Valentine's Day type scenarios? People don't know what to buy, right? So maybe there's an incentive there that you want to do, and those are the type of things that pricing really works if you're going to do it this way to 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 as a call of action. Pricing a product at a good value could lure customers to purchase other products at full value. That's the whole idea to this. Okay, so you lose it here, but you gain it there at the end. You didn't lose anything. Okay. Okay. All right. Fundamentals that affect pricing for photography business. What is it that affects pricing? Client consultation, right? Just think of all the things you have to do. So it's not just a matter of going out and photographing it. You have to consult the client. The consulting of the client could be on the phone. Then they can come to your, to your office and talk to you some more, and so on and so forth. What other expenses that you may have, just in general, that a lot of people don't even think about? What about education? Okay? Now, I'm not talking about just you know, a college education. I'm talking about workshop educations, if you're out there, that you might be paying $200 for the day. Uh, and how many of those are you going to do a year that people really go out there to learn something, right? And you're going to be doing this. I, I mean, I've been doing this for a long time. I'm always constantly going to conventions. Conventions are expensive. 
Okay, but you're going there for the purpose of coming back with at least one idea. One idea, not just in how to photograph. One idea that you can come back that hasn't been done yet in your area that you're going to really pound it and try to create some action. Right? And that's the whole point of conventions. Okay, and so that, that costs money. How much is that going to cost per year? 3000 5000 Unless you do two of them, you're going to be into those type of numbers. Okay? Uh, market, marketing expense. Okay? Marketing expense or the time you spend on social media, that's all money. If, if you decide that you're going to spend an hour a day on social media, if you decided that your business needs $300 an hour, how much did it cost you? $300. If you spent two hours, well, then it could just cost you $600. If you start to think that way, it's not like, oh, I just did it myself. It really doesn't matter. And it, no. Every minute, every hour costs you money. Okay? So you have to think about it that way. All right? Photography session service. When you're out there photographing, what about when you're driving there to get to the photography session? Right? So a session, you know, even if you're only there for an hour, it took you half a day. By the time you pack up, you go, it's a half a day. So you charge for an hour, but really you're out there for three hours. So you have to figure out how this is all going to be. And how are you going to do that? You're going to have to sell a product. So how are we going to sell a product so we come up with the right numbers at the end of the month? So these are all the different things. And what about the photography product that manufacturing? What the cost is to manufacture the product that you're overlooking? You might be self-contracting some of that, but doesn't that cost money? So we really need to know how that really operates. How much is this going to cost us? So if, for instance, an 8x10 print in a frame and a mat and a glass is then they're going to cost us, I'm going to throw just a magic number in the air, it's not correct, because it depends on what you're buying and how you're doing this, what you're printing it on. Let's say it costs us $75. Did it really just cost us $75? It costs us a lot more than that. We photographed it. We had to sit with the client for an hour and a half to get a sale out of it. Okay, we had to convince them that 8x10 was not too big or not too small. I'm just throwing a size in the air. I mean, all of these different things all cost money. What about the projector that, you, that you've used in order to show this client this image that you're trying to uh, sell? Right? That costs money. That costs you $5,000. What about the bulb that it takes to, to run? I'm just looking at all of these things. They all have to come out of a bumper. We have to think about it. Okay, so very, very important that everything is in line that we actually understand what's going on. Okay. All right, pricing for sustainability. That's basically where I'm going now, right? I've been basically talking about that all the way through. Pricing structure is one of the lifelines to a successful business. All right. Some novice photographers set their price according to the competition. Prices are set by cost of doing business and your place in the marketplace. That is the key. Cost of doing business and your place in the marketplace. So with that, what does that mean? Your place in the marketplace. It's where you set yourself. Where you set yourself or where you are at the moment trying to go to another spot. Because everybody wants to be at the top of the market, right? But not all of us can be at the top of the market. We're always fighting, striving to be there. So we need to know exactly where we are in that marketplace. So if we know where we are, then what happens there is where we actually have to juggle some volume because that means instead of charging a thousand you might have to charge 900 if you did 20 jobs you lost a hundred dollars on 20 jobs so now you have to do another job to recover that right so now we have to so it's a balance of volume and a balance of money so we have to know our place based on the cost of doing business the cost of doing business usually is the same for all of us give and take a little bit of rent cars a little bit but let's say everybody drove the same car and everybody has somewhat of the same rent, then that's when the volume game really starts to play because everybody's on the same playing field, right? Okay. Any questions so far? Okay. Fundamentals that affect pricing in a portrait and wedding photography business. Now, I'm calling it a, a portrait and wedding photography business. It could be any business. You could be selling shoes. And the fundamentals are exactly the same. You could be selling cars. You could be selling whatever you want. Glasses. The fundamentals are exactly the same. You're playing with volume. You're playing with price. So if you look at glasses, for instance, you go to a department store. 
set of glasses is two hundred dollars. Go to another store. Well, you can get the you know top brand name of some designer, and all of a sudden the price went four times over, and people are buying it. Why are they buying it? They look the same. <coughs> They might be made a little different, but they look the same. Why are they buying? Perceived value. Somebody says, hey, you know what? If I wear those, I'm going to be able to see better. Is that it? No. I'm going to be able to look better, or I'm going to be more chic, or I'm going to be whatever it is. Whatever it is, somebody's created perceived value. That's it. It doesn't mean that they're fools by doing that. All it means is, there's your value. Okay? And that's all we're talking about. All right. So... The cost of doing business, the quality of the photography in our case, and the final product. So that means the final product has to be a good product. Now, if your client base, for whatever reason, you're in this, uh, a little bit lower of a client base and you're trying to sell a top of the line, let's say, wedding book, right? Top leather, all of the you know, fine designs, but your client can't afford it, then you have to find that you, know, you have to have a good, better, best. Right? So that that way you come down a scale and does it make a difference to you? No. Because your, your, your formula is set that you're going to make money on every one of those products. So it doesn't matter if you're selling a $500 album or a $300 album. Because your formula is the same. Okay? You're just putting out more money, but you're getting more money. You know what I mean? Or you're putting out less money, but you get a little less. But that's basically what's happening. So if a client says to me, oh, Sam, listen, I can't afford it right now. I can't buy that top of the line uh, album of polka, uh, you know, leather design, but I can buy that the one a little bit lower, it's still leather, but in the pages a little thinner, but it's a beautiful book, right? Not a problem, because I've already, my markup is the same. Okay? That's all. And then that way, it's not high pressure sales. You come out like, you know, like a bouquet of flowers. <laughs> okay, so very, very important. So the quality of the photography, the right product. Have the right product for your clients so they know exactly what they're buying. Stay away from things that they can actually purchase at a department store. Because then that's where you're going to have a problem. If you buy something at a store, uh, out of your supplier, and then there's something that's maybe a department store down the street has the same product, well then, you're competing with them, and you're competing with big volume, which we're not in that position to do. So you have to sell things that they don't sell. Stay away from it. If they sell canvas prints, you sell fine art prints. If they sell fine art prints, you sell canvas prints. Mm -hmm. Right? Whatever they don't have, then you're not in that competition. You stay away from it. And that's the best way to do it. The perceived value of the photography and the, and the final product, that's what you want to do. When somebody looks at it and says, wow, you know what? I love you know, what you did. Cost me a whole thousand dollars, but it was a thousand dollars well spent. Okay, one of my favorite lines, especially in photography, when they say, "Well, you know what? That just cost me five thousand dollars." I said, "You're right, it did, but it was done very well. We put a lot of effort in this. Yes, but it was five thousand dollars." I said, "Yes, but just think of it. If you amortize this over a lifetime, what did this cost you a year?" Right. And what's this going to be worth 10 years from now when we can't repeat what we just did? It's unrepeatable, right? So is it going to be worth that much more? It's priceless, right? So we have to have the right answers. You can't agree that it's expensive or say, well, you know, you almost got a bargain here. Let's think about it if you amortize this over 25 years. I should charge you more. What? <laughs> right? Okay. All right. So let's look at some of the numbers, okay? And I know some of you hate math. And I've got to, you know, how many of you hate math? 75% of the room. Hey, hold on. I'm going to put both my hands on All right. But, you know, it kind of grows on you because I start, you know, in the middle of the night sometimes I wake up and I start doing these mental cal calculations without a calculator that I can come up with the formulas mentally now, right? It was great practice. But, uh, it just helps you understand the way where you should be. So if you have to try to figure out how much do I have to charge the client? Well, based on the formula, you shouldn't have a problem to figure it out. 
it should actually be there to figure it out. So let's look at a couple of different scenarios, okay? A cost of sales, 40%, 50% general expense. Let me go backwards for a second, just for a second. I just want to check something. No, I'm moving forward. Hold on. Okay. I'm in the right place. So let's say in this case, you have 40% cost of sales. Okay, what is a cost of sale? What is general expense? So I'm going to explain it. Because nobody's saying anything. <laughs> so I'm going to do all the talking, okay? All right, so 40% cost of sales is whatever this product that you're selling is the cost of sale, basically, okay? The general expense is everything else that goes with it. Rent, cars, gas, cameras, lights, all that kind of stuff. The other one is to put it together, the employees and all of that. So that way, 50 and 40 is 90%. Okay? So that leaves you 10% profit. If all goes well. So what are the things that might affect you in that profit? Yes, if you have to reprint it, if you have to remake it, absolutely. Some kind of an error that kind of happened when you were printing and it's actually your fault. You did something, you know, towards late at night, didn't see it, went out, and it's over. Then you have to redo it. So that's going to come out of your 10%, right? So actually that 10% can be, that's your, like your buffer, and you want to try to hold on to it. I don't like working on 10. I like to work on 15%. And, and I'll get to that number in a second. So basically, if you look at it, total, sale, total sales, 100%. Cost of sales, 40%. Gross profit is 60% that goes to your general, okay? And, uh, net profit, 10%. Cost of sales is 40. Divide 40 into 100. Gives you a cost factor of 2.5. You get me? Follow me? Okay? So that 2.5 is the magic formula number. Out of all of that, if you don't want to remember any of it, you want to remember the 2.5 if you're going to use this formula, this particular one. Why is that? If you have a product that costs you $10 and you multiply it by 2.5, you get $25. That's what you sell it for. Okay? That's how you come up with it. That way, you can't go wrong. If somebody wants a discount, how much room do you have? Do you say, well, it's $25 here now, let me knock off $5? Let me knock off $7 and give you a break? Do you say it that way? I don't. Right? I know that there's 10% profit on it. How much of that do I want to give up? 5%? 2%? So let's say it's 5% just because you want to be a nice guy. And whatever that number is, that's the way I'm going to explain it. I'm only working on 5%. That's all I can give you. And... Right, so that, that way there's not a, a, a discount argument going on a dollar value, it's only on a percentage. You already know exactly what you're going to lose. So you have to be so almost disciplined. And for me, it took me years to get to this after I got beat up a few times, you know? And it just, you know what? You get beat up a few times, you don't want to keep getting beat up. So you just know the answers and you just keep going on that. Okay, so let's look at this one. 35% cost of sales. This is a pretty good one, okay? So we have total sales, 100%. Cost of sales, 35%. Gross profit, 65%. General expense is 50%. Net profit is 15%. So you take it. If you got to look at this number, cost divide 35 into 100. The COS on this, cost of sales factor, is 2.9%. So if something costs you $10, what are you going to sell it for? 29 Period. Right? So if you want to give away 5%, what are you selling it for? 25 Because I remember the other factor. It was 2.5 and it came out to 25. Now, you know what? That was 35%. The other, this one's at 40. There's a 5% difference. So the 5% took me to 29. 
So if, if I have to discount it by 5%, it's 25. It's all here now. Because I just stick to those little Mickey Mouse formulas, which is the lifeline. It keeps you straight. And what happens when you're talking this way to a client and you're able to talk in this type of percentage and the way this works? Are they going to try you again? Not a chance, because it would be too sharp. I don't even know what he's talking about. Right? And that's what will happen. And that takes time to do, you know, and, and people start to understand and they say, okay, this is, this is being run like a business. Okay. All right. Let's keep going from there. Okay, what happens if you have a high cost of, uh, not a high cost of sales, a high expensive place? You decided to go into a very expensive place, chandeliers, the whole thing, and the place is decked out. So this is another formula for that. And what happens is that you're going to, it's going to be a 30% cost of sales to try to get 60% general expense, which tells me you've got an expensive place going on. And it doesn't have to be location. It could be uh, area, okay? Size of place, area, you decide to drive a fancy car. Who knows, right? All of a sudden, your expenses are really high. You're not playing by the same game. So that means your cost of sales is 30% to get a 60% general. Is that you follow me? That still only leaves you 10% profit if you have it. Okay, so total sales at 100%, cost of sales 30%, gross profit is 70%. General expense is 60%, net profit is 10%, divide 30 into 100 is a cost factor of 3.3, okay? So, if you have a product that's $10 and the cost factor is 3.3, what do you sell it for? $3, uh, what's your saying? $33. That's right, 3.3. So, it's, see how it's coming along? Okay, all right. So, let's move on from there, okay. All right, so material cost to produce a product that is $100 at 40%, we just did this, $100 times 2.5 selling price is 250 At 35% COS factor, multiply the 100 by 2.9 selling price, 290 The other one is 30% cost factor, multiply it, the $100 by 3.3 selling price, $330. Okay, so it's pretty straightforward. You know exactly what we're going to charge. You're going to knock out 5%, you know where you're going to be. Everything is through form. Everything is a formula, it's in, in, in a, a price list that's put together properly. Right? So that that way there's no maneuvering, there's no fooling around. You know what your price list says, you know what you're going to sell it for, and you know how you're going to try to sell it up. So you have to kind of sell it up in a way that makes sense. So just like when we're marketing and we're using pricing to market, we know what we want to market in that price list as a, uh, a, a call to action, but we know based on the prices how we're going to get it up there. So I know that if, uh, I, let's say I'm selling a wedding and the wedding has 40 images in it and it's a smaller size, then I'm going to try to show more images and try to bump it up to the next size. And the reason for that is because I'm going to get more money for bumping it up to the next size. And if I sell more images, I'm going to get more money for that. So I'm going to try to increase my sales by another 40% if I can. So if I start off at $4,000, I'd like to end off at $7,000 if I can in an average sale. So you will know, based on your client base, where your average sales are going to end up, depending on where you are in your marketplace. Okay. So I just threw a number in the air. Some people might be 4,000, some people might be 5,000. Don't get caught up in that because where you have to get caught up is, is in your formula and your cost of doing business. Okay? That's what you, so it doesn't matter how much you're selling it for. It matters how much you retain in your pocket in a profit budget based on your cost of sales. Okay? All right. So there's an art of pricing, okay? There is an art of pricing. And the art of pricing is that, just like I said a minute ago, you, there has to be a way that you're going to sell it out, okay? Selling it and pricing it all goes together so that that way you price something that has more incentive to sell up where your cost difference is very small 
but your profit is very big. Okay, so maybe at that point, that product might not be at, let's say, a factor of 3.3. The boosting product could be on a factor of four. Okay, so there's nothing wrong in your price list to have some products at 3.3, some products at four, some products at 2.9, depending on what it is. Okay, or you might not sell it. Like for instance, frames. I like to sell frames. So I like to sell frames with every one of my portraits. I want it to go well with the frame. So am I gonna factor it in at four? I may factor it in at 2.9. So that that way, I might be right in line with let's say a department store, but they'd rather give it to you because they're gonna pick it up and it's complete. So what I do is I go to the framer and I say, okay, Mr. Framer, here it is, this is the print. I want you to put a mat on it, a glass, and a frame. This is the frame. And you, you work out, you negotiate your price based on the volume that you're gonna do. And then that way, I'm gonna mark up the whole complete thing that they put together at 2.9 or 2.5, because they did all the work. All I did is I dropped off an image. They put it together, I picked it up, and I sold it. Okay, because the, the, the making of the image, we already priced it. Okay, so that's, what is that? That's like free money, right? If you price it right, it's free money. If you try to gouge them on that frame, gouging, there's, I mean, or try to get more than you should be, you're not going to sell it, okay? So you got to be able to sell it. So you have to understand what you're going to sell more in volume and what not and what you really want to do. So to me, if I make an extra $100 on every one of those portraits, on every one of those frames that go out the door, at the end of the year, I've made thousands of dollars that I probably would have lost if I didn't think about it that way. So we have to be very much in tune in what's happening around us, what the department stores are selling, and stay away from that and price things accordingly where people have perceived value. When they come in and they say, you know what, your prices are pretty good and that's a good product. And that's what you want. Okay? Okay, so the fundamental formulas are set to make sure each product or service Sale can contributes to the production of the product, including general expenses. That's the whole point. Every time you sell something, it's got to make money and it's got to contribute. If it doesn't, don't do it. Okay? If it doesn't, don't do it. That wasn't me, but I'm just doing the same. <laughs> okay. All right. So each photography business must find the correct price point for their place in the market based on perceived value, product quality, the technical ability. Okay, all of these things make sense, right? So, for instance, uh, years ago, I went to, uh, I was at one of my jobs. I had somebody, another photographer, there doing the more point and shoot, fast, rapid printing type thing. Plus, they were doing some other jobs, and you know, he was uh, kind of bragging to me that they had five or six jobs going on that night, and I only had two. But the thing is that my two. I was grossing more than his five or six. So who's King Kong? <laughs> right? But let them think what they want. Right? It doesn't matter. You don't, don't get caught up with the volume part. Get caught up with where you are in the profit part. Okay? That's what you get caught up with. Don't worry about that. Do your own thing. You do your own thing and don't worry about them. You're going to be fine. Okay? Know where they are and what they're doing. You always have to know what they're doing, but don't get caught up with it. Okay, so product value. Okay, each photography business must find the correct price point. I said that, right? Okay, a photography business should have an effective price catalog with a list of items and volume packages priced by your working factors, which I just explained. So the price catalog should have a good, better, best. Some of it could be priced at different factors because that's the ones you want to sell more of or less of. It's just there. There's a, there was a common thing that was done even years ago, right? It, uh, they call it good, better, best. And I'm going to call it good, better, best, better, and even better, okay? Because where do people usually want to buy? At the top or at the bottom? in the middle, right? So if you only have one middle, it might not be at the right cost factor. So you have three middles. One a little less, one a little bit more, one a little bit more. It's very confusing, but there's nothing really confusing about it. 
more profit, more profit, more profit. That's what's not confusing. Okay? And that's what you want to do. Is you want to be able to do it so that they're getting perceived value, you're getting perceived value. It's a win-win. Soon as somebody loses, not a good idea. Okay? Nobody should lose. Not the photographer or the artist, and not the client. The client should be getting exactly what they paid for and be proud of what they paid for. Period. If they're not, then you either pay too much or not enough. That's why I say find your place and then keep growing because education, even small workshops and all that, is going to make you grow. It's going to take you to that next level. Okay. So, the business. I very, I very much believe in qualifying the client, just like the client is usually qualifying you. So, that's what kind of has taught me to answer a question with a question. So, as I get asked a question, I ask, I ask a question back, because I want to know more than you want to know, okay? And that's just the curiosity that I may have, but realistically, I'm not being curious. I'm just trying to see, is this a job that I want to take on, or is this a job that I want to pass off? Because it doesn't fit my model. Not because it's no good. It's good for somebody, somewhere. It just doesn't fit my model, that's all. And that's all it is. It might fit somebody else's. So, qualify your client. Make sure that the client is right for you. If that client could be a headache, you know right off the bat that is not the style that you photograph, you would have to change your whole style to accommodate and walk away. Because you're not going to make a dime. You're going to lose it. You're doing it for free. Walk away from it. Let somebody else that is qualified to do that job do that job. Another one will come. Okay, so do it that way. That's the best thing. All right, so qualify your client. Be a professional to attract the right client. Deposit schedules for positive cash flow. Very important. Why is that? Because photography business or artist businesses generate cash is Cash flow is generated by their deposits. The bank will not touch you because the, the orders are too long. It takes them too long, especially on a wedding. Book you now for something that happens next year. The order's taken a year, two years, three years, four years, five years later. Okay, You have to try to price something from five years from now. Well, I don't have a crystal ball and nobody else does. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what tariffs are going to be put on. We don't know anything. Okay, so you can't do that, right? So you have to give yourself clauses and openings for certain things. Very, very important, okay? So qualified cash flow is done by that because the banks will not touch you. Anything over 90 days is a deadbeat account, okay? That's just the way the banks look at, it, look at it because they don't understand the photography business in the wedding industry, let's say. So if that's the case, good cash flow is important. Pricing for profit, very important. You gotta make sure that you get a profit on everything you sell, okay? Product and image enhancements, editing and setup, all of those things are in there. All has to be calculated, regardless if you're a one-man show. If you're a one-man show and you are pricing something at a, at a discount because you're saying, well, I'm gonna do it anyway. Who are you doing the favor for? The client. Because you always have to look at it and say, hey, I work for this company. I may own the company, but I still work for that company. So the company is a different identity. Okay, The identity is paying me to photograph this job. So that, that way there's a retained profit in that company in order to pay for my leased car and so on and so on. I'm just throwing things at you so it, just, it opens up. So that's how the whole thing should work, no matter what. So the client shouldn't say, well, you're going to do it yourself. Well, I'm not sure. I may do it myself, but I still have to pay myself. So I can't discount it by 30% because I'm shooting it myself. Right? The company has to make its profit. So product and have these all in there. So let's say a cost for four, I usually think for studios that have employees, should be at a 3.3 to 4 in order to survive it. Okay. So if that's a times four product cost is 25%, overhead 25%, staff should be 35%, including the owners, and your profit should be 15% if all goes well. Okay? And so if things get reprinted, or there's a problem, or if something broke down, or your car broke down, where is it coming from? 
It's coming back from that 15%. That's your buffer. If you give it away every single job, you're not going to have a buffer. Then you're going to start running a negative. You, in, and if you keep running negatives, very hard to get out of negatives. Okay? Because those 15% or 10%, you're going to have to accumulate them to get out of the negative. Right? So you have to keep your foot on the throttle and stay in line with your cost and pricing factors. That means you're constantly watching what things are costing. But if you're using the formula, aren't you automatically watching what things are costing? Okay? And that's the, for that's the whole secret to it. If you know what a cost is and you're pricing it based on the formula, you know you really can't go wrong because you, you've done your, your, your work for it, right? Okay. All right, so let's take a business model of $200,000. I just do, you know, easy math type things. So $200,000 in sales. On a, on a times four model, $50,000 becomes your product cost. Your product should not cost you more than $50,000 or less. And you're going to say, well, how are we going to do that? Well, first of all, what you guys pay for an album, I would pay for an album. What you guys pay for a camera, I'm going to pay for a camera. What you guys pay for a car, I'm going to pay for a car. Give and take, small money, right? So we're all in in this. Now, if you're doing more volume, you might be able to negotiate a better price on some volume, but you're doing tons of volume. So your game is going to be, you're going to have a hard time doing it at times four if you're doing a lot of volume. Because usually at volume, you're at 2.5. That takes volume. When you're at times four, that means you're not doing heavy volume. You're doing high priced, high profit, you know, so you have to really be in line, okay? So your product cost should cost you less than $50,000. Very easy to figure that out, isn't it? At the end of the year, if, you're, if all of a sudden your album frames and all that cost you $60,000, there is a problem. And the problems could be Maybe some frames were bought and never sold. Maybe some frames were bought and never were to be sold. Maybe, you know, who knows what it is. Or you made some mistakes, right? There's a problem. So you know right away. $50,000 should be in rent, tax, and utilities. No more than that per year. That's it. If you spend more than that, you're in the hole based on a $200,000 uh, gross sales. Staff should be $70,000 at that point. No more, yes less, if you can. But if you're going to pay somebody Mickey Mouse dollars and you're not getting the right person, then there's no point. Pay what it's supposed to be, get the product out there, and you're going to make more money at it. Okay? And then your profit at that point should be $30,000, providing you don't have an extra $10,000 in product cost and $10,000 in um, rent and taxes that all of a sudden you get more money. Where do you think it's going to come from? From the thirty thousand. So now you got ten thousand dollars. Let's say you gave away five percent per, per client. Now where are you? Five thousand dollars. Let's say your car broke down and some a couple of other things went. Now where are you? You're broke even. So hopefully you made your salary. So that's why you have to really be in tune with what's happening. Make sense? Okay. Okay, we're going to look at a portrait model, but what is it that most artists don't like to do before we get into this? We don't like the business part of it. None of us do, right? We hate, we, we hate the business That's part. Here. That's where you're here. Nobody likes the business part. I hate the business part. I hate trying to collect money. I hate listening to the stories. It's all part, but it's part of the game. I've heard more stories and games than I've, I've ever heard in my life. You know what? As soon as I pick up the phone, I already know what's happening before they even almost open their mouth. I hear it comes. Right? You already know. Right? So, and you have to document things. It has to be done. You either have a fantastic memory, not everybody has, and or write down everything that goes on. Every time you call somebody, if something is ready, you call Mrs. Whoever or Mr. Whoever, and you say, hello, yes, I'd like to tell you that your album's ready for pickup. Oh, yes, uh, let, me, uh, let me get back to you when my partner comes back, 
and I will, um, I'll get back to you so that we can get the money together. Okay, so you're going to get back to me. Yes, you better write that down. <coughs> and the date. Exactly what was said. Because you might get a call three years later <laughs> saying, I'm disappointed in you. You never dropped off my album. And I'm saying this because I just got this happening to me. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I mean, I let you go, did I? Okay, let me go check. Yep, it's still on the shelf. So I go back and I said, went back to my notes, but I have an excellent memory. I went back to my notes and I said, okay. You were supposed to get back to me. Your partner was supposed to come back. You were going to let me know when you had the money together. You were going to let me know when I can drop it off. I'm still waiting for the phone call. But I gave up because you never called me back. I don't chase you. You have to chase me. Well, it's all my fault. And I said, well, let me get this straight. You owe me money. The album's on my shelf. And I want to hold it on my shelf because I didn't want to drop it off. Don't you think I want to get paid for this? No. Okay, that was about two weeks ago. <laughs> and I still haven't got an email or a phone call saying, yes, we have it together. So these are the things that you're going to learn, you know, when you get beat up every single time. And you're going to learn and you have to understand how you're going to get out of these stories because you're going to hear all kinds, all kinds of different ones. So we have to be on top of it and always stay professional. Why did you order album without money? No, because the order was big and this was one small part and there was a deposit and this is the balance. I did not lose money on the job, but okay. that's my 5% <laughs> or my 10%. Okay, and that's why I want it. But, okay. Or without zero, there, nothing's happening. Okay. All right. So let's look at a portrait business model. Show me the money at the end of the month. How many portrait sessions to create a sustainable portrait business model? Let's use a $50,000 business model. Good enough? Okay. Session only. That means you're not selling any products. Just a session. You take $50,000, you divide it by $250 if you can get that for a session, equals 200 sessions per year. Is it doable? Who wants to do it? We're looking at 50 grand here. You want to do that for 50 grand? Out there 200 times? You're going to have to buy a new car every year. Okay. <laughs> All right. So let's look at it in a different way. You're selling a product. $50,000 divided by $750, so that means with product, that equals 66 sections. Is that doable? Yes. Absolutely it's doable. It's doable because there will be the times where you're going to be doing two a day, three a day, so on and so forth. Still a lot of work though. I mean, this is a lot of work. Okay. All right, so let's look at it again. Let's do $50,000 divided by $1,000 equals 50 sessions with a product with a chance of selling more like that frame at 2.5, things like that, which printing for sales would change the sales percentages based on products sold. So now you're looking at making more profit. So is 50 sessions doable with a product? So it is doable. Now that's a sustainable business, providing that you have your, you're in the right marketplace, that you're selling the right product, that you hit a niche that people want to buy. Now, thousand dollars might be a lot, so maybe it's seven fifty. Seven fifty, you know, it's there. If you're selling the right product, you can do that. You're selling a frame, a this, a that, an album, whatever it is. You're selling a product. Okay, it's not just air, and it's doable. This thing that's going on right now, how much per hour at two hundred sessions in a year for fifty grand? Why? It makes no sense, does it? Okay. So why does the market exist? Why, um, why does that market exist? I think um, that's a very good question, sir. And the only thing that I can think of right now is that I think there's a lot of people that um, decided to get into the industry because they thought it was quick bucks. 
and they really don't want to get involved in making a product because it's a lot of work to do and the client could call you 10 times for a certain product and they figured, you know what, I have a full-time job. I might be able to do this on the side. I go out there, I make $250 for the day. That's pretty good money. I have to work for $250. I might have to work two days somewhere, per se. So it depends on where this person's coming from. That's why everybody, it's different. Am I going to say that's wrong? No. I'm going to say it's a different perspective. But at the same time, that perspective, maybe that client would not hire, let's say, somebody like me. Because it wouldn't, right? So that way, there's a right client for everybody. So I'll get to you. Yeah. Get to you. So I think that that's part of the game. And I think there's a lot of new people that really don't understand the way the operation works. There is a lot of education going on right now on selling product again. Okay, so I think it's all coming back and people are starting to learn business and, and, and sales and marketing and all that in order to actually make a profit in this. Actually make a better profit, regardless if it's full-time or part-time. And that's all it is. I think that's why. So right now we have a run of this, but I think it's going to change. Good question, sir. You sort of touched on my question, but uh, so they increase your perceived value. Yes. And to differentiate yourself from, from like photographers like that, like, like that he was mentioning, to include, to push more to include product, like, like even like family sessions, like yeah. that, is that what you're saying? That's yes, I, I refuse to uh, yeah. get into a, um, again, we're gonna, I'm going to change this. I personally don't like doing with the hourly thing. And I don't like uh, selling files only. And that's because I know that I really want to sell product. And what I've actually done, because my model would be, and um, I'm a full-time photographer. So if I'm a full-time photographer, if I have to go out there on a weekend to photograph a session or a portrait or whatever it is, I've basically done that. I want to get paid for going out there on that weekend. But at the same time now, I'm going to sell a product in order to get paid to work during the week. Okay, so I'm making, I'm creating a job for myself for during the week. Now, if I'm only going to sell a session, meaning files only, um, I haven't created a job throughout the week. I wouldn't be able to hold on to the studio because it, look at the numbers. It speaks for itself, right? $250, what is it, 200 sessions. I mean, you wouldn't be able to police this all. And never mind if they say if we want them fully edited. Sure. <laughs> right on it. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry, I don't want to monopolize that. No problem. But the reason why I ask you too is because one of the challenges we face is is geography. Yes. We work all over, so in person sales is not something that makes sense for us because we're not in a big market. We're up near Collingwood. Yes. And uh, so we do we do a lot in Collingwood, but we also do like um, like King Carter, even like when I'm talking about weddings and family photography. Yeah. Um, so like we. we, we still find we're trying to find that balance in terms of like product and but this is kind of the answer then you would try and make your perceived value 750 without the product so that you're having to work less yeah that would be kind of the answer that is kind of the answer at the same time this is my way I run things by my wife too. <laughs> Sometimes we uh, we start to get some big ideas. Like that. We need somebody to put you back on the ground. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> so basically, yes, yes, and yes, right? Yes, yes, yes. These are all scenarios that are happening out there. There's no magic formula to this other than find your position in order to create perceived value. That's the wording. Is it easy to do? Not a chance in the world. You gotta work it, work it, work it. Now, in a situation like yours, I have weddings that are from out of town. They may be in New York, some of them are in Europe, whatever it is. So, I put images online. You might put 1,500 images online to look at. They're not gonna be able to select this. So then they come back and he said, this is very confusing for me, not a problem. <laughs> not a problem. What I do is I go through and I pick the best one of every scenario. <coughs> Then I show it to him. So now I cut it down to what, 150? Right? My what I want to sell is 125, 150 images with 60 pages. That's my target. So I it's all set up where I shoot for sales and I get it down to that 
Then they say, yes, I like those, Man, minus one, maybe I'll change that. Then I say, okay, we're going to get it to like 50, 60 sites with 125 images, and that, priced properly, will get you in a good profit situation. Because you're going to sell 50 paid sides, and then you're going to sell, out of the 50 sides, you're going to sell another 75 images. Even though they're just images being printed on those pages, uh, because that page could hold four images, let's say, you're going to charge for the extra three because every page comes with one image. Then you have to sell the other three. You still have to produce that file. You've got to process it, you've got to edit it, you've got to crop it, then you've got to design it in the page. Who's paying for that? Right? So it's all part of time. So even though they're away, if you get a chance to do that, and then you say, these are the hundred and something that I chose, they're going to look at it, you may pull a few up, you get it back, design it, send it to them again, they're going to look at it, you might do a couple of changes, done. It's done. That's, so you don't have to have them in front of you, you can do it that way. But you might have to do a little bit more thinking at it. And if you know that's going to happen, do it while you're editing. Okay? You know you have 1,500 images, you know you're going to put it on a site, then you're going to pick the best one of every one, already do it, and say these are the best 125 or 50 that's going to create a great storyline for your album. Start to end, you know, the, starting with the ring, blah, 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 and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. You've done the work for it. All they have to do is say yes or no. Right? And it's all said and done. It's done. So it's, it's doable. It's very doable. Good? Okay, we'll keep going? All right. Good. Okay. Printing for sales would change the sale percentage based on the products that sold. We talked about it. Okay. So now we keep going. Quality work demands premium dollars. Okay, so that's, I mean, that is what it's all about. You got to do it right if you're going to demand premium dollars. Selling the right product gives your studio credibility and trust. Okay, so if you're going to sell something that a department store is going to sell and you're going to try to charge more, makes no sense. Okay, without mentioning names, there are albums that you can get online and they can get it online and so can we. So how... Do you think you're going to sell that product when they can buy the same product? Right? And then try to charge them more. There's one answer to that. And the answer is you've created the photography. So without your files, they can't print it. Right? So if you don't sell them the files or give them the files, they can't print it. This game's over. There's nothing to talk about. That's where the problem is. Okay? So you either have to sell the files on a separate basis than the session. Okay, so the session should never come with the files. It should be session plus files, because that's the product. Or session and the product, and maybe the files, because that's the product. Okay, the session is only to be there to shoot it. When you hire somebody to come and fix your fridge at home, they don't come with a secondary fridge. <laughs> okay, they come to fix your fridge with some tools. Then they say they need parts. Then they will order the parts for you. What is the difference? Does that make sense? So we have to think like, we have to think logically in order to make this thing happen. Okay. If you wish to follow me on any of these things, you're welcome to it. Okay. Uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter, and uh, Instagram. For now, you're welcome to it. And at this point, Love to hear some more questions. How are we doing for time? Not bad. Wow. Very good. Okay. Yes. How do you deal with family and friends, and friends of family who expect discount? <laughs> Very difficult, but but yes, yes. But again, go back to the principle that I said before. Just say, listen. My profit margin is ten percent. Can't explain that to family. Well, you can't because my profit margin is ten percent. <laughs> That's what I make. I'll give you what I make, ten percent. Here, oops, shouldn't have done that. <laughs> Microphone's on. But that's basically all you do. If you want to give them a little bit more because you're going to do your part of it, your session for less. Okay, that's your business. But if you want to talk about it in a business point of view, you're only making ten or fifteen percent. You want to give that away. That's okay. 
I mean, because it, it is family. But you, they can't expect you to pay for everything because it costs money to do that. I mean, it's just, just to drive there, right? So on and so forth. So there's got to be a way to make them understand. And I understand because I've gone through it. And sometimes, you know what the best thing to do? Don't do it. Let somebody else do it. Uh, okay. I'm going to work my way this way, okay? Anyway. A uh, question about, uh, about files and stuff like that. How long do you keep your files for? Indefinite. Indefinite? Yeah. Because I sell a product, I'm working on orders from 10 years ago. So you hold on in case... Yeah. I mean, I had deposits on it and things like that. So I didn't... Uh, my expenses were paid. But if they come back and place an order 10 years later, that's found money. So that's not on the shooting end of it. That's on the week end of it, right? So during the week, I'm doing something that was done 10 years ago that might have been goodbye. They might have been divorced, right? The best ones for me is when, you know, they've gone elsewhere and they come back with a bunch of files and they say, Sam, please help me because I don't know what to do and I need to get an album like before and all that. That's, even, that's great because I priced it the same way, but I didn't shoot it. There's the package. Right? So actually, I'm now at time six. <laughs> right? So I get those zips from, from time to time. Work my way down. Did, did I answer yeah, your yeah, question? Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. So if you're providing files, yes. do you ever provide files? And if you do, um, how are you going to make any extra profit or any sell product? First of all, the files are not completely edited. Not editing 2,000 files. You couldn't pay me enough. You know how long it takes to edit 2,000 files? We're talking about two months, three months. So they're not paying you enough to do that. So, but if you're selling a file, let's say it's part of this and you sold it for whatever, basically editing to me is not retouching. Editing to me is you white balance it, you didn't crop it, because you don't know what they're going to print it on, if they're going to print it. Is it going to be a horizontal album? Is it going to be a vertical album? Is it going to be a square album? So you have to photograph it so it fits all of these things. How are you going to crop this? Right? So you basically leave it so that you're giving them the options. Somebody's going to have to work this. Now, the point at that point is, if you're printing albums, I would suggest you come back to me. And that's usually what happens. And I think you, you give them JPEGs so they can't even... That's right, they're JPEGs. Yeah, they, they can't they're JPEGs, they have to be cropped and they got to be edited. They're just white balanced. And that's how I've basically gotten away from that. Because that is the right thing. I'm not trying to pull a fast one. It is the right thing. I don't know what you're pinning on. I don't know if it's what it's going to be on. What profile do I give it to you on? SRGB, Adobe 98, with what soft proofing? Who knows? I don't know what to do. So I just give them Adobe 98. A lot of people, you know, they say, well, you know what? Uh, that profile doesn't print well. Well, you should have converted the profile to wherever you're printing. That's part of the service, right? Every lab, every book company has different profiles and different soft profile proofing. Get to you in a minute. Got to work my way. Oh, yeah, no problem. Come back down. Yes, sir. In your example of the $200,000, you had 70 for staff and yeah. 30 for profit. Is that 70 paying you also? At yes. I used a $200,000 model yeah. just, in the, just to give you a percentage point. Realistically, that would be a good model for a four hundred thousand dollar business. Okay, the numbers work better at four hundred thousand than they do at two hundred. But if you had a two hundred thousand dollar business, that's good for let's say yourself and possibly a part timer, and even at the, and then you're going to use the thirty thousand to to boost to boost your income. So now you don't want to give away any of that because realistically, it's coming from there. But don't forget. It's, it's there, plus in the product cost of the job, there's a certain percentage of that job that is a shooting fee. The shooting fee is on top of the 70. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so realistically it's more than that, but we don't know who the, 70, who the shooting fee is going to. Is it the owner of the studio, or is it a photographer, or some, you know, another photographer? So. You have to keep that on a separate basis because that is cost per job. 
Like a second shooter? Right? Like a first and a second shooter. First and second shooter because it's cost per project. Right? So the cost per project isn't identified in that staff part because that staff part is if you're running a full time place and you have somebody opening your door, right? There's no shooting fees in that 70,000. That is just for people that are working there full time. Could be one and a half, could be two at 35,000 each, right? And then you have the people that are photographing in order to, and then somebody's editing, right? That's in the cost per job. So that's why it's in that other department. Got it out, you know, all broken down. So it's really more than 70, but depends on who's shooting. So if you want to pay yourself, let's say, $50,000, just saying, and there's $20,000 for a part-timer, but then you need more than 50, well, you're going to go shoot, so you'll make 100, oh. right? Yeah, maybe you have two more questions? Sure. Uh, Some people can stay after to talk to you. Yeah, them. okay. So let's go one, two, and then you had one, right? So three. Okay. Um, I'm just starting out, so I'm just curious where, like, is it just hard research to find um, products such as, like, frames, 8 by 10s like, where to go printing and stuff like that, or, like, is it just trial and error? As far as where you're going to print? Yeah, that kind of like idea. what you're going to print? Yeah. Well, basically, you have to figure out what products you're going to try to sell. Mm -hmm. What are the products you want to sell? Meaning, you know, what books they are and all that. And I would research all of that. That's why conventions are good. Because they're all there, mm -hmm. and you can test one or the other. Or you ask people that have been around a long time and say, try that one there. Don't go based on a price, because you might be getting something that will fall apart in a year, and then the client is going to call you back, you have to redo it. And that's going to cost you money, because you're going to have to back that up. So talk to people that have been around a while. Try a couple of different companies, right? And uh, all these companies have a good, better, best. So they have, you know, like more cost-effective products and so on and so forth. And as far as framing, the same thing. There are a couple of frame companies. There's not a lot of them now, but there's a good two or three big ones out there still in Toronto that, that do a pretty, pretty good job and good service, right, and price well. Okay, does that make sense? Yes. Okay, good. Sir? Yeah, uh, do you ever get a uh, phone call with, say, commercial shoot where they want a price per image? Like, say we need to have 10, 10 images. Or Commercial two, shoot. Yeah. And, and we're photographing what? location, and you have the discussion. They want to know how much it's going to cost per image. Absolutely. And what are we shooting? Sorry? What are we shooting? Uh, it could be product. It could be, the, it could be a company, like a, a company office. Like, like architecture? Yeah. Well, it depends on how much. idea of 10 images that come down. I don't care about the images. I care about how much time it's going to take first. Right. Right. So I don't charge by the hour. Right. I'm gonna. I I go ahead and say, okay, it's going to take me at least a half a day to do this, yeah. whatever it is, or a day. So if it's a half a day, let's say you're at six hundred dollars. If it's a full day, it's a thousand dollars. Then you're going to sell ten prints. What size are the prints? Today they would they wouldn't say prints. They would say, give me ten files. Yeah. So I would. Say, well, what are you going to do with the files? That's my next question. Question with a question. Well, we're going to market with this, these files. Then you have to look at it and say, okay, if they're going to start marketing and putting them in magazines and so on and so forth, are you going to sell these files for $50 each or $200 each? Because you're going to, you're going to give them the copyright on it as soon as you do that. Right? So you have to decide what you're going to charge them at in order for you to feel good at the end. Right? So in theory, at the end of the day, you've got to make $2,500 on this. Right? That's where my head is at. Yeah. What's going to be my contribution factor? If they're going to say, no, do it for 500 well, you know what? We can find something else to do for 500 Make sense? Did I? Okay, good. So my question kind of piggybacks on that one. Okay. So in terms of copyright production, say you sell the photos to a client, um, and you put in the terms, like, they have the rights to the photo, but they can't sell it to anybody else. And you put it in your terms. But say, for example, like say if you were to shoot kind of this wall for a company, but then whoever manufactured the sofa just takes it and then uses it. Can't do that. What would be the process to go about action? 
Well, you would call them and you just say, well, listen, you know, that image has copyrights. The, the copyrights were written down that it was only supposed to be used by this company for that. Okay. Okay. This is another company that you're using it for this, and there is a fee to that. And I have to approve the fee to boot. I have to prove the copyright and the fee. Can't you? Okay. That's basically how you do it. And when you're doing the copyright thing where you're selling the file of the copyright to anything, a company, a bride, whatever it is, if you decide that you want to be the printer of that wedding, but you're giving them files, in the contract you should say, if you are to print, you have to come back to me. Right? So you can stipulate, your you can stipulate that in your contract. Stipulate whatever you want. Now, the thing is, if you're going to pursue it, that's another issue because it could cost money. But something big with a big company that's going to take something on a couch, put it on some worldwide billboard, well, that's a different story. Right? Mm -hmm. You've got something to stand on. And plus, they wouldn't do that anyway. But if they did, it's not in writing to do that. And okay. you have to have it in writing. You have to really watch everything you do. Thank you for coming out. It's been uh, great, and, and uh, hope you enjoyed it and you got something out of it.